Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I am the program coordinator for the NAVEN project. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our friends at Cherokee Health Systems for hosting today's session. Should I get a PSA, the nuances of early detection of prostate cancer with Dr. Stephen Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman was a urologist at Kaiser Permanente in Portland, Oregon for over 30 years until his retirement. He was chief of the department for 27 of those years and had a teaching appointment as clinical professor of urology at Oregon Health Science University. He had special interests in urological oncology, calculi and endourology and pediatric urology. Since retiring, he has written a shared decision-making book for patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, and he created a DVD that accompanies that book, and now he volunteers for the Maven Project. Dr. Lieberman, when you are ready, please begin. Okay, thank you for all um, for all of your interest in PSA. It's a question that I get frequently asked by a variety of people. Um, should I get a PSA? I get asked when I play golf with people that find out I'm a urologist. I get asked by uh, people working in the free clinics that Maven serves. Uh, and I get asked by relatives. And it's a frequently asked question that's not very simple to answer. Answer. Uh, but most of the time, the answer is yes, but it depends. So um, I'm going to start. I don't know if you need to see this. That's just about me. Um, I'm going to start before talking about the goals, about my personal uh, involvement with PSA. Uh, I finished my urology residency in 1982. At that time, there was no PSA being used clinically. It was still experimental. And at that time, when I was uh, serving as chief resident at the VA hospital in Portland, we had about uh, between 20 and 25 patients on the ward. And I would say that half of those patients had metastatic prostate cancer and were being treated with IV still phosphorol uh, or radiation for their metastasis. Uh, sometimes the metastasis were involving um, the spine and we're compressing the spinal cord. So those patients were in, uh, in a lot of trouble. And uh, many of those patients would go on to die within the next two years. Then I went into practice and about three years into practice, 1985, uh, PSA uh, was starting to be clinically used. And uh, we were using it very often. Um, and we were doing lots of biopsies, which were done at that time uh, blindly and transrectally and, uh, or perineum, through the perineum. And now we, we do them with ultrasound guidance and sometimes MRI guidance. Um, so when I was a resident, uh, I would say that half the patients that I took care of who presented with prostate cancer had advanced or metastatic disease. And we knew at the time that doing a radical prostatectomy on patients with stage, what was then called stage C or now uh, T3 disease, uh, were not cured by radical prostatectomy or even the combination of radical prostatectomy followed by radiation therapy. They would go on to have progression and uh, oftentimes metastasis and oftentimes die. Um, and, and so during my residency, the only people who were candidates for radical prostatectomy were patients who were diagnosed on the basis of a rectal exam with a prostate nodule. Because in those days, when a person presented with symptoms of prostate cancer, we got an acid phosphatase. When the acid phosphatase was elevated, we knew that they had metastatic disease. So during my residency, I did a total of two radical prostatectomies, two, during a five-year residency. When PSA came around and we started diagnosing prostate cancer earlier, we did lots of radical prostatectomies. Uh, I was doing probably two a week, uh, 100 a year before uh, the robot came around uh, uh, 15 years ago. And when the robot came around, uh, I went into uh, practice. I turned, uh, because I was going to retire within 10 years, I turned the uh, robotic surgery over to uh, my younger partners and they took up the, the call to do radical prostatectomy. So when the robot came around, I did very few open radical prostatectomies, but until then we were doing about two a week. So it, it points out that the PSA 
and, and we noticed a stage shift from the time that PSA came around from over 50% of patients presenting with advanced or metastatic disease, it went down to about 10%. So we knew that, that there was something good about PSA. We, we thought that we were diagnosing it earlier, curing people, and uh, we definitely reduced the number of patients who presented with uh, advanced or metastatic disease. So that, so I've been a, a real proponent of using PSA as a tool for um, screening. I'm, I'm not gonna, um, I, I wanna point out the difference between screening and early detection because people talk about screening and uh, I'm gonna talk about what defines rational, effective and optimal prostate cancer screening. But what we're really doing is we're, we're trying to detect prostate cancer early in those patients who would most benefit from treatment. And that doesn't include the entire population of men. Um, so we're gonna talk about who should be screened, who should be that population of men who uh, deserve early detection and who would benefit from early detection. When should we start the screening and how often should we screen? Because that's real debatable and it's incredibly variable. You know, you'll find some people that, it used to be that we recommended PSAs every year on everybody over 50. Well, that's changed. And it's, it's a good thing that it's changed because we were diagnosing a lot of cancers that did not need to be treated, the so-called clinically insignificant or indolent cancers. And that's because PSA is not very specific. Um, we're gonna talk about why and when we should not screen and who we should not test. And uh, uh, we're gonna talk about the, the shared decision-making um, idea that, that uh, if shared decision-making is definitely necessary, but who should do it and when should it be done? And then we're gonna talk about newer things on the horizon and, and it's a rapidly evolving um, uh, strategy for, for using PSA in concert with many other things to detect people who would uh, benefit from early diagnosis. So that's what this is all about. That's what the, the controversy is all about, um, is who to test, when to test them, who is going to benefit, who's not going to benefit, and uh, uh, how we can effectively use PSA as an early detection tool in conjunction with other things. So in answer to the question, should we screen or not, you want to show a reduction in mortality. Uh, you want to avoid premature death from, from prostate cancer. We want to reduce the morbidity. That means that if you diagnose the cancer early, before it can spread, you're not going to uh, see the morbid complications associated with advanced and metastatic disease. And that comes from both the disease itself and from the treatment. And the treatment of advanced metastatic prostate cancer usually involves hormone ablation. And, and I can tell you for a fact that's not very pleasant for many men who are on hormone ablation therapy. The screening should be practical and cost-effective. The tests and the procedures uh, are uh, hopefully non-invasive and with minimal morbidity. And uh, that's one of the uh, one of the reasons that PSA as a screening tool has come under attack is not because of the blood test itself, but because the blood test triggers a transrectal ultrasound and a biopsy, which is invasive and is associated with some complications. Uh, and then we'll talk about sensitivity and specificity of the, of the PSA test itself. So if the screening tests are too sensitive, that means that you're going to detect tumors that will be diagnosed that are too small. That means they don't need to be treated or that they're slow growing and the patient will never suffer morbidity and mortality from the cancer. We call these clinically insignificant or indolent cancers, and many of the prostate cancers that were diagnosed early in, early in the uh, life of P PSA uh, were clinically insignificant cancers, and uh, uh, the evolution of uh, early detection of prostate cancer is sorting out those cancers who are, that are clinically insignificant as opposed to those that are going to be clinically significant. Uh, if the test isn't sensitive enough, then it's a worthless exercise, and there's no reason to do it because there's no benefit. Uh, a negative test, that means uh, if the PSA is, is so-called normal, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, what's normal and what's not, 
that may lead to a false sense of security, meaning that if, if your PSA comes back one and uh, the person didn't do a, a, a digital rectal exam, we know that, that certain prostate cancers present as abnormal digital rectal exams, but normal or what's thought to be normal and low PSAs. This is a different kind of prostate cancer. Sometimes it's a very aggressive prostate cancer. And uh, there's an anecdote I can relate to you a little bit later in this talk that talks about the, that I, I think it's important to do a digital rectal exam, even though you've been told probably that you don't need to do it anymore. But there, there are gonna be a, a, percent, a small percentage, less than five to 10% of prostate cancers that will present with an abnormal digital rectal exam, yet a, a normal for that person's age PSA. And these are usually, or not usually, but sometimes they're very high grade, uh, fast growing clinically significant cancers. Um, the test has been criticized as having low specificity, meaning that there are too many false positives and that you're gonna uh, lead to uh, many invasive tests. That means transrectal ultrasounds and biopsies that, no, that don't need to be done. Um, so in combination with diagnosing clinically insignificant tumors, plus subjecting men with positive PSA, with high PSAs to a test that they may not need has resulted in this whole controversy. And the low specificity, say a man has a PSA of, let's say a 60 year old man has a PSA of six. Well, that would be high for his age. And if his biopsy is negative, he's still gonna be anxious about the fact that his PSA was abnormal. And do I have prostate cancer? Did they miss it? Um, do I need another biopsy? There's all kinds of anxiety associated with that problem. So why screen for prostate cancer? Well, it's the most common cancer in the United States men, um, second to skin cancer. Uh, th this number of 170,000 is probably wrong. It's probably more like 200,000 cases are diagnosed every year. And there are approximately, when I made this slide, there are approximately 27,000 deaths from prostate cancer. And that would be the year of 2018 or 19. Um, but if the prostate cancer is confined to the prostate at the time of the diagnosis, which it wasn't when I was a resident, as you know, since we only did, since I only did two radical prostatectomies uh, during my residency, if it's confined, confined to the prostate at the time of the diagnosis and is treated, the five year survival that is no evidence of disease and with disease is 98%. No evidence of, without evidence of disease is more like 95%. 10 year survival with and without disease is 96%. 15 year survival is 94%. These are patients who have been treated either with radiation or with surgery. Uh, the survival for advanced T3 or T4 metastatic disease, five year survival is 30%. So that's why we screen. Men who have localized disease are usually without symptoms. That's important because if, uh, that's just important. Um, uh, advanced and metastatic disease, three and four, T3 and T4 are incurable, but treatable with hormone ablation and other uh, chemotherapy and perhaps radiation. Um, but you're not gonna cure anybody. And you're certainly not gonna achieve uh, uh, five-year survival uh, numbers that you do if the disease is confined to the prostate. Uh, there's significant morbidity and expense associated with treatment of stage three and four disease. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, there's significant morbidity for metastatic disease alone, not, that's not including treatment. And that uh, includes pathologic bone fractures, spinal cord compression, and lymphatic obstruction. If you get Disease in the uh, lymph nodes, public lymph nodes, they can cause obstruction and cause lower extremity edema, which can be uh, debilitating. Not to mention the effect of uh, uh, metastatic disease to other organs like lung or liver. So I'm gonna say it again. There's, there are usually no symptoms associated with, associated with prostate cancer that's confined to the prostate usually don't see symptoms from prostate cancer until the disease is uh, very advanced and causes ureteral obstruction, for example, or symptoms from metastasis. So one interesting study was done in Detroit in uh, 
uh, mainly uh, black men who had died in their 30s from a gunshot wound or an auto accident or some other unrelated cause. These were healthy men who uh, died prematurely and they did autopsies and looked at their prostates. And they found that 30% of these men had prostate cancer in their prostates. And they learned from that, we learned from that, that with each advanced decade, the incidence of prostate cancer increases by 10%. So a 70 year old man has a 70% chance of having prostate cancer in their prostate if you were to do autopsies on 70 year old men who died of something else. However, we know that, that not that 70% of those prostate cancers, a majority of them are gonna be clinically insignificant. And I would propose to you that a majority of those men in their 70s who have a 70% of prostate cancer, who are discovered to have prostate cancer, clinically insignificant prostate cancer, are gonna have, for their age, normal PSAs. So <clears throat> keep that in mind as we continue this discussion. So as I said before, the pre-PSA stage distribution, that means before PSA was available in 1985, 50% of men diagnosed with prostate cancer on the basis of an abnormal digital rectal exam or symptoms had advanced or metastatic disease. After PSA was uh, clinically used between, let's say 1985 and 1990, there was this, we noted a significant stage shift. That means that instead of 50% of men diagnosed with advanced or metastatic disease, 10% of men were now diagnosed with advanced or metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis. So PSA is a protein that was discovered in 1979, and uh, it, it started being used as a screening test in uh, 1987. In, uh, and this is where another um, anecdote comes into play. Uh, one of my residents was a guy named Joffer Bashi. And in 1977, we were sitting around in the office when he came in and said, I just admitted a patient with uh, a PSA of 600. And uh, he's obviously got, he's got bone pain. And so I said, okay, work him up. And I said, Who are you? how many of these patients do you think come in off the street with really high PSAs and with metastatic disease? And he says, I don't know. I said, I, I don't know either. Um, but it seems like whenever they come in and we look back in their records, we find evidence that they had seen a primary care physician within the 10 years of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I wonder how many of them were offered a PSA uh, or a digital rectal exam. And so what we did was we uh, went through the tumor registry and we found 100 consecutive men who presented to Kaiser Permanente in Oregon with metastatic disease. And that is the first time they came in off the streets presented with metastatic disease, usually on the basis of a, a symptoms or, and a really high PSA. Uh, the resident and I, Joffer Bashi, looked back at all of those hundred members, and we wanted to know how many of them were Kaiser members within 10 years prior to being diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. Turns out that 85 of the hundred were Kaiser members 10 years prior to coming in off the street with a markedly elevated PSA and metastatic disease. We then asked the question, how many had been seen by their primary care doctors? All 85 had been seen by the primary care doctors within 10 years of prior to being diagnosed. We then asked the question, how many of them were offered a PSA? Turns out that none of them were. How many of them had a digital rectal exam? None of them had a digital rectal exam. So that uh, another reason that, that we did the study was that I had a, um, a patient who was a very he was a, a very well-known guy in the uh, sports field. Um, and he was referred to me for, for gross hematuria. And I put his, uh, at that time we were doing IV, IVPs. I put his, he was 50 at the time. I put his IVP up on the board and I noticed that his right ureter was pushed way laterally. I thought, oh, that's not good. I wonder if he's got something in his rectal peritoneum. So I did a rectal exam. He had a rock hard, really rock hard prostate, very abnormal prostate. And uh, <clears throat> I, I cystoscoped him because of the hematuria and he had a fungating mass growing up 
from the prostate into the floor of the bladder. Uh, and uh, it was bleeding. And, and we biopsied it. We took him to surgery the next day and resected it. And it turned out to be uh, uh, poorly differentiated uh, at uh, anocarcinoma of the prostate. Very anaplastic, anaplastic, anaplastic. His PSA at the time that he presented was less than one. His digital rectal exam was extremely abnormal. I looked back in his chart. He had been a Kaiser member for 10 years prior to that diagnosis and had never had a rectal exam and had never had a PSA, even though he was uh, African American uh, and even though he had, uh, uh, well, we'll just leave it at that. He went on to die three years later. <clears throat> so, um, most of the screening and testing guidelines uh, do not recommend uh, a PSA. If you look at the, we'll talk about the US Program Task Force. Uh, recommendations in just a second. But all of them say that the, uh, uh, you should have a discussion regarding the benefits and harms of doing a PSA. And who's, who is that burden on? Is that burden on you or is that burden on us, urologists? Is it burden on primary care to have its discussion of the benefits and harms of a PSA or is it up to the urologist? Uh, there are uncertainties about getting a PSA, and I'm gonna try and dispel those uncertainties. And together, you and the patient are supposed to arrive at a decision about whether or not to do a PSA. Well, I can propose to you that this is hardly ever done. Um, it's just from my experience in dealing with uh, the internists at Kaiser and with the primary care providers uh, at Maven, that, that Maven serves. Uh, I don't know that you, you guys have time to do this. Uh, it takes a good half hour to talk about the risks and benefits of obtaining a blood test. Uh, last time I checked, uh, the blood test at Kaiser costs $8, but I'm told that if you do it in a private lab, it's more like $100. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about the fact that screening for prostate cancer or early detection of prostate cancer it is not controversial anymore, not in my mind. It hasn't been controversial for years. And a lot of it depends on how, how the screening, how you define screening and who gets screened and by whom. I'm also gonna tell you that there's no such thing as a normal or abnormal PSA. You're gonna get a lab report back that says PSA of 3.5 and then alongside the lab report it will say, normal PSA is less than four. Well, that's totally wrong, totally wrong. So there's no such thing as a normal PSA. Every man has a unique PSA and risk factors associated with the development that, that can predict the development of clinically insignificant or clinically significant prostate cancer. And that's how you should look at PSA. Not as normal, but something that's useful in predicting risk of having clinically significant prostate cancer. Before a shared decision-making conversation can occur, knowing the risk of high-grade aggressive cancer will help. So as I said, every man has his own unique PSA and PSA goes up as there's a, the bigger the prostate, the higher the PSA, that's just a fact. P, BPH makes PSA go up. Prostatitis and a urinary tract infection will make PSA go up. If you instrument the urinary tract, P, PSA will go up. And if your patient comes in a day after having sex to get his PSA drawn, that ejaculation that he had the night before will cause a rise in his PSA. So I would advise strongly that you employ a prostate cancer risk calculator into your decision and discussion with your patient in deciding whether or not to get a PSA. Risk calculators are available uh, on the internet. You just Google prostate cancer risk calculator and you'll see a whole variety of them. And my favorites are the one from uh, University of Texas at San Antonio and the Cleveland Clinic. And I'll show you an example of the Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic risk calculator um, in just a second. And, and you know, this, this should not be uh, foreign or unusual to you because 
you do this all the time when you decide to put a person on a, on a statin. You, you figure out what his risks, risks are, what his or her risks are of having uh, a stroke or a heart attack or a heart disease. And you put that into the equation and say, well, if we put you on a statin, then your risk is gonna reduce by this amount. The same thing with hypertension. You know, what are your risks? Should we treat your hypertension or not? Well, what are your risks of having an adverse uh, health problem related to your hypertension? So what goes into the prostate cancer risk calculator is the age of the patient, the size of the prostate, because the bigger the prostate is, the higher the PSA is. So a PSA density, which is the PSA divided by the PSA volume, is going to predict whether or not that patient could have prostate cancer. So, and I'll, I'll give examples of this in just a second. But the volume of the prostate is, is, is important. The bigger the prostate, the, the higher the PSA. The smaller the prostate, the lower the PSA. The prostate, if the, if the PSA in a, in a person with a 10 gram small prostate is say three, you might think that that's normal, but his prostate's only 10 grams. So he's got a, a, a higher chance of having prostate cancer than the person with a 10 gram prostate who has a PSA of one, or a person with a 60 gram prostate who has a PSA of six. And I'll explain that a little bit more in, in detail. PSA velocity is just the, the change in the PSA over time. So if the PSA uh, changes from uh, two to three to four over the course of uh, two years, that's probably significant. If the PSA changes from three to six over the course of a year, that may be really significant, but then you need to look for other causes of why the PSA could go up. Did the person have an infection? Did he ejaculate before he obtained the PSA? Uh, did, uh, was he recently instrument? Stuff like that. Uh, family history is important. That goes into the risk calculator. Drugs can affect the PSA. So if you have a person on Proscar from Asteroid, that person's PSA is half of what it would be when not on Proscar. And there are other drugs that can lower the PSA too. Uh, <clears throat> and so I, I strongly recommend uh, at least checking out the prostate cancer risk calculator. And this is an example of the Cleveland Clinic uh, risk calculator. Um, this, this, these data on the, on the right, you, you just go to the website and you plug this, these numbers in and uh, you'll, you'll see what happens. So these are my numbers. Um, I've never had a prostate biopsy. I was 66 when I made this slide, I'm white. Um, no family history. Um, my rectal exam by my urologist was normal. My PSA at that time was two, and my percent-free PSA was 25. We'll talk about percent-free PSA in a minute, or actually we can talk about it now. Uh, PSA in the serum exists in several forms. Um, many of the forms are bound to a protein, and some PSA is a free protein floating around in the serum. You can actually measure the amount of PSA bound to proteins and the amount that's free, and the uh, free PSA divided by the total PSA, that is free PSA plus protein bound PSA is the percent free PSA. Percent free PSA goes up in benign disease. And if it's greater than 22%, there's a much less risk of having prostate cancer. If it's less than 10%, there's a much less risk, uh, there's a much greater risk of having uh, clinically significant prostate cancer. So high percent free PSA, good low percent free PSA, bad, okay? So this is what happens um, when you use uh, percent free PSA. So we're just taking my numbers again. I put these numbers in, uh, if my PSA were, were two and the percent free PSA was 25, the probability of me having any prostate cancer on biopsy is 19.6%. That's all, all comers. The probability of having high grade cancer or what we would call clinically significant prostate cancer, that means a Gleason sum score of seven, which I'll explain in a minute, is 6.7%. So what is a Gleason sum score? Well, a Gleason grade is what the cancer looks like under the microscope in terms of its cellular morphology and its architecture. It's graded on a scale of one to five. One is relatively benign disease. Five is highly aggressive anaplastic cancer in terms of cellular morphology and architecture. If you 
take a biopsy, there's going to be more than one Gleason grade present on the biopsy. So um, say you have a Gleason predominant Gleason 3 and then a little bit of Gleason 4. The sum score is the Gleason score or 3 plus 4, which is 7. So anything higher than 6, 6 or less is probably clinically insignificant depending on the volume of cancer present. Anything greater than six is, has a potential of being clinically significant. So um, it's really important to understand what people talk about when they talk about Gleason grades and Gleason scores. So if the PSA were four on this risk calculator, but the percent free PSA was 15, you can see how it changes the numbers. It goes from the probability of having prostate cancer from 19.6% to 40%. And the probability of having high-grade cancer goes from 6.7% to 16.9%. And if you take it a step further and say the PSA of, for the PSA of six, percent free PSA of 10, the probability of having any cancer is almost 60%, whereas the probability of having high-grade cancer goes up to 27%. So it's really important when you talk about PSA to realize that, that it's not a simple positive or negative, not a simple uh, dangerous or not dangerous, not a simple uh, thing. So the uh, transrectal biopsy is done usually when the PSA is indicative, when the risk calculator is indicative of a, of a risk of having clinically significant prostate cancer, that, pa that patient wants to take the risk and have a biopsy. The risk of having a biopsy is about 1% to 2%, and the risks include bleeding and infection. Uh, I've done thousands, if not tens of thousands, of prostate biopsies using a transrectal ultrasound and local anesthesia. Uh, I can tell you that it's not painful. Um, it's, it's rarely complicated. I had one, one or maybe two patients who had a, a, an infection serious enough to require hospitalization. Uh, patients will bleed. Uh, the bleeding usually stops. They can bleed in their urine or bleed in their semen. Uh, and it's usually short-lived. There's been uh, maybe a dozen occasions where I've had to put a, a suture uh, transrectally into a, a bleeder that was uh, bleeding in, into the rectum. Um, but overall, it's not, it's not a, a very complicated procedure. In a little while, I'm going to tell you that it may not even be necessary. Um, at first, it may not be necessary. The positive biopsy rate <clears throat> is uh, variable, and it depends on how many patients you're biopsying, for what reasons, and uh, uh, I guess the technique. But my personal experience is that my positive rate was about 33%. That means in the thousand patients that I subjected to biopsy, I uh, find prostate cancer in about 300, over 300 of them. That doesn't mean that I treated all 300 of them. A lot of them, or some of them, uh, were candidates for active surveillance, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, a high suspicion that is high risk of uh, having prostate cancer when you have a negative biopsy should uh, 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 prom promote a second biopsy. And uh, repeat biopsies, this is sort of outdated, but it's it still holds for many urologists. If, if the person is at high risk and uh, you can have a, a, the initial biopsy is negative, the repeat biopsy will yield 20% uh, positivity. So uh, we talked about risks of being between one and 5% in the literature. And there is pain uh, associated with the biopsy, but not when I do it. <laughs> and I, I don't, I mean, we, with the ultrasound, it's a wonderful, uh, technology that we can actually see where the nerves going to the prostate are and under very, very controlled and accurate uh, targeting, we can put a little uh, xylocaine with a uh, spinal needle right where those nerves are and produce very excellent uh, local anesthesia prior to the biopsy. So all the patient feels is the vibration from the biopsy you know, going in and out of the prostate rapidly. Um, it's very, very effective. It's very, I mean, I would hazard a guess that nobody does prostate biopsies anymore without local anesthesia because it's just, it's just 
very comfortable procedure. You know, none of us want to hurt patients. I mean, it's really very easy to do. So in 2012, <clears throat> I was at an uh, American Urologic meeting in Atlanta where the US Preventative Task Force pre presented their uh, level D recommendation to which recommended against prostate cancer screening. This recommendation was made in front of a thousand urologists in a room in Atlanta, Georgia. It was based on three studies, the PLOC study, which is prostate, lung, ovary, and colon, the European prostate study, and the Gothenburg uh, study. Uh, it was concluded by the panel of experts that all three studies were flawed. The authors of all three studies were part of the panel. They all agreed that the studies were not good studies and that the US Preventative Task Force made a big mistake in using those studies to promote their level D recommendation. I should <clears throat> also say that on the, pan on the US Preventative Task Force for prostate cancer screening, there was not one urologist and not one oncologist. Why were the studies flawed? Well, the control groups were contaminated. They really weren't control groups. The control groups, many of the men in the control groups had PSAs. Many of the men in the control groups were treated. How could they be considered control groups? So you had a, a, a group that was the the test group being screened with PSAs and treated. You had a so-called control group that was being tested with PSA and treated if the PSA was high. They were totally flawed studies, it was ridiculous. If you look at the studies, the groups were not stratified. In other words, they weren't stratified according to age. They weren't stratified according to comorbidities. They weren't stratified according to grade. It was just, it was crazy. Um, so if you took two groups and you had groups ranging in age from 50 to 80, it's, it's, and you concluded that, that neither group benefited from screening, that, that the control group, that you show no difference in mortality for, in either of the group. Well, you've got 70 and 80 year olds that are dying from something else, not from the prostate cancer being compared to the other the, uh, test group. It was, the, the studies were bad. So, they concluded that there was no significant benefit to screening with respect to mortality. And it was mortality only that they were talking about. And the reason they couldn't show a difference because they didn't stratify the groups and the groups were contaminated. Uh, and they didn't talk at all about morbidity. Not once is, is morbidity mentioned. Not one of the authors of the Plock study, the European study or the Gothenburg study agreed with the recommendation. And they went on to show that if you do stratify the data, according to age and medical comorbidities, grade and stage, there's a definite advantage to screening or testing. So experts criticized the recommendation because the basis of the uh, data was misinterpreted and much of it was flawed. Morbidity and advanced disease and metastasis were not mentioned. Morbidity and expensive treatment of advanced disease were not mentioned. The stage shift, what we noted was that after they came out with their uh, recommendation, uh, internists, uh, family practitioners, primary care providers all stopped doing PSAs. And what we saw over the last 10 years was a, the stage shift back to a higher percentage of patients presenting with high grade and advanced stage metastatic disease. Now, just for the fun of it, not really fun, but uh, for the, well, for the fun of it, I, I looked up, I Googled uh, litigation associated with late diagnosis of prostate cancer. I got 130,000 hits on Google. I found one study uh, in Pennsylvania that discussed 106 cases. 70 of those cases went to trial. 46 were found in favor of the plaintiff. Most of the defendants were uh, uh, primary care providers who failed to offer or discuss a PSA test. And the settlements range from one to $2 million. So we're not just talking about improving the healthcare of our patients, we're talking about keeping you out of court. So, I'm going to recommend uh, my own personal screening strategy, which is, which over time has eventually evolved into uh, what I'm going to tell you. Um, and I've been saying this for 
uh, I don't know, five years or so. Uh, ever since I wrote, uh, I've, I've, <coughs> I've done a lot of writing about this, but anyway, um, I think I think all 40 year olds should have a PSA. All 40 year old men should have a PSA. Why do I say that? Re regardless of their race, regardless of their family history, even though we all know that prostate cancer is more common in black people and black people have more, um, a more highly advanced disease when they're diagnosed. But, and, and family history has something to do with prostate cancer, but regardless of their race, regardless of their family history, I think we should do one PSA on every 40 year old, or at least one PSA of every person in their forties. Uh, we know from good data that 40 year olds who have a PSA of greater than 1.5, that would be regarded normal by most of you, by most labs, when four is the cutoff, but there's a 50% risk of having high grade cancer later in life. They, these are the people that should be tested and screened. These are the people that should be referred to a urologist. 40 year olds who have a PSA between 0.5 and 1.5 should have a repeat PSA at age 45 and again at age 50, incorporating the knowledge of PSA velocity. Because if their PSA doesn't change from one to 1.5, then it's probably not significant. But if it's between 0 0.5 and 1.5 at 40, and it goes up to two at 45, you're gonna significantly benefit that person by seeing whether or not he has prostate cancer. Because you're gonna be diagnosing it early when it's localized. If his PSA is at 45 is still less than 1.5, you don't need to repeat it again until he's 50. If a PSA and a 40 year old is less than 0 0.5, I would recommend repeating it again at age 50. If it's <clears throat> less than two at age 50, probably should do it uh, maybe every other year. If it's still less than one at age 50, I don't know, maybe every fifth year would be reasonable. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about avoiding biopsies in everybody by doing an MRI before a prostate biopsy. Talk about that in a minute. So what else goes into decisions about whether or not to do a biopsy or a repeat biopsy? Well, there are some new uh, tests that are available. PCA3 is a urine test. <coughs> Free and total PSA we've talked about. And there's a, a, a test called ISO PSA, which has uh, been developed at um, the Cleveland Clinic. And it's uh, quite a good test that differentiates between those PSAs that are um, uh, clinically significant and those that may not be, or those that are associated with a higher risk of having clinically significant disease. Um, I was involved in getting this study, the ISO PSA started because uh, Kaiser in Portland was one of the test sites, but it's, it's turning out to, to be a very good test and it, it makes PSA better. It makes a, a, just a standard PSA test a better test. Um, and then there's a, another test that measures circulating tumor cells in the plasma. MRI, as I'm gonna talk about in a minute, is uh, gonna be a game changer in prostate cancer early detection. It already is in, in Europe and Great Britain. There are some uh, genomic tests that are proving to be very important, uh, particularly BRCA1 and 2, which is the same BRCA test that uh, we do for breast cancer. Uh, ATM is another genetic marker. Uh, and uh, Oncocyte DX is a, a variety of uh, variables that predict which cancers are gonna be clinically significant and which cancers are gonna be uh, not. The whole point of this is that if a PSA triggers a biopsy or an MRI, say, you wanna be able to differentiate between, and, and cancer is diagnosed, you wanna be able to differentiate between a cancer that's clinically significant versus a cancer that is clinically not significant. Clinically significant versus clinically not significant. That is, if it's clinically significant, it has a high chance of, of progressing, growing fast, metastasizing. If it's clinically insignificant, it's likely to be um, uh, an indolent cancer, a slow growing cancer. And those patients are best served with uh, active surveillance. If they're, they're 
young, or young meaning less than 75, uh, and, and have a greater than 15-year life expectancy. We want to put, put them on active surveillance, which is different from watchful waiting. Watchful waiting is uh, diagnosing a cancer in an elderly person with uh, multiple medical problems and just watching the cancer to, to make sure it doesn't uh, cause harm uh, prior to uh, that person person's demise at age 85 or 90. And uh, it's uncommon to be treating anybody over the age of 75 with prostate, who has prostate cancer, unless the cancer is advanced metastatic, causing symptoms, um, or is likely to be uh, a really bad actor before the other medical problems uh, overtake that patient. Uh, there's uh, some uh, people that are uh, using uh, deep learning, which is a high-speed imaging processing software uh, using uh, modern digital scanners and increased computer power to assign uh, histopathologic grades to cancers to try and figure out which ones are going to be bad actors and which ones are going to be indolent. And you can find uh, a lot of this work on this article that I've uh, cited here uh, comparing. Uh, <clears throat> this talks about uh, multi-parametric uh, MRI with and targeted biopsy with systemic biopsy alone. Uh, and this is really a critical paper, this one on MRI. Um, so as I said, uh, multi-parametric MRI, which is a, a, a different than the standard MRI, it's, uh, uh, it involves different techniques and is highly uh, refined and, and requires some training. Uh, so what they did in this study was they, it was a randomized, seven randomized tri trials involving uh, 2,582 men. They uh, reported a 57% 50, improvement of detection of clinically significant cancer of the prostate over transrectal ultrasound and biopsy alone. They also noted that 33%, there was a 33% reduction in number of biopsy procedures necessary. That means repeat procedures. And there was a 77% reduction in the number of cores taken during the procedures because you're accurately directing your needle into the abnormal area of the MRI. Typically, we take, uh, I, I would take 12 cores in a template uh, when doing a prostate biopsy. And they, show, they showed a, a dramatic reduction in the number of cores needed. The more cores you take, the higher there is, the higher the risk of bleeding there is, the higher the risk of infection there is. Although I, I have to say that the, the infection problem has been uh, markedly reduced if you uh, pre-treat with uh, antibiotics and you give an antibiotic pill after the biopsy. And we usually use ciprofloxacin. If the patient has been on ciprofloxacin in the uh, six months prior to the biopsy, we would give an aminoglycoside uh, intramuscularly <laughs> before the procedure and that cut down significantly on the number of infections after biopsy. The multi-parametric MRI will identify clinically significant cancers that are likely to progress, but will not identify low cancers, low-grade cancers, clinically insignificant cancers that will cause no harm in the forthcoming, forthcoming 15 to 20 years. That's pretty important. Um, and that, that was the conclusion of this paper, which I referenced there, okay? So, there was an article in 2009 on the MRI and early detection of prostate cancer. Um, the prostate uh, targeted biopsies using MRI were more accurate at detecting clinically significant prostate cancer and reduced the uh, overdiagnosis problem of indolent disease by 50% and allowed between a third to a half of men to safely avoid immediate biopsy. Prostate MRI has been a useful and cost-effective tool for the early detection of clinical and prostate cancer. In the United Kingdom and several international guidelines have uh, formally recommended MRI before even doing a prostate biopsy. What if the MRI is negative? Can you still, you still not need to do a biopsy? Well, that depends. Uh, there was a study called the PROMISE study, which compared the standard uh, transrectal ultrasound biopsy to an MRI in men who had not had a prior biopsy. And they defined clinically significant cancer as any 
uh, cancer that was Gleason score, Gleason, Gleason grade four or more, or the volume of cancer was greater than six millimeters in the uh, biopsy specimen, which is usually about a centimeter long. So that would be a 60% volume of cancer. Dr. Lieberman, I'm just sorry to jump in. This is a time check. We have about nine minutes left and we have a number Yeah, I'm of almost done. Okay. I'm almost done. Um, so the MRI showed a, a sensitivity uh, in um, within five millimeters of the uh, template biopsy of 93% versus 50%. And you can find that information in the, the Lancet article. Uh, PSA density combined with MRI will improve the sensitivity and specificity even more. We talked about PSA density. A PSA density of less than 0 0.08 is indicative of a low risk of clinical skin and prostate cancer. Uh, if the PSA density is greater than 0 0.15 with a negative MR, uh, MRI, uh, your index of suspicion needs to be higher. And so you'd probably want to biopsy, you'd probably want to biopsy those patients. Uh, their uh, incidence of their hazard ratio of having clinically significant prostate cancer is 7.57, uh, 7 which is uh, pretty high. Um, men with a high PSA density and negative MRI with a high uh, suspicion of prostate cancer should be offered a biopsy. <coughs> uh, the, we talked about the complication rate of the biopsy being between 1% and 2%. Um, saturation biopsies are when uh, we have a high clinical, su uh, clinical su su suspicion of having prostate cancer, uh, and you do 50 biopsies under anesthesia. Uh, that's with MRI, that's probably a procedure that's uh, becoming very uncommon at this time. Uh, however, the retention rate after uh, saturation biopsies is 10%, impotence rate is 14%, and there's a significant uh, rate of sepsis and bleeding afterwards. Um, if the MRI is negative, there's less chance of diagnosing indolent disease compared to transalkyl cell biopsy. And that's in uh, this paper, which looked at uh, 1,255 men. Um, and it followed them up and showed that for the negative MRI, there was a 99.6% chance of being free of clinical significant prostate cancer three years later. So new guidelines for prostate cancer early detection are uh, in the National Health Service in England, uh, UK National Institute of Health and Care Excellence and European Association of Neurology. All of them do an MRI before uh, a prostate biopsy. So why not do an MRI on any man with normal PSA? Well, it's already the new standard in prostate cancer early detection in Europe. The technology is not available in some institutions, but this is getting better over the past two years. Uh, not all radiologists or urologists have been trained to read uh, multiparametric MRIs. Uh, the cost is 10 times higher in the United States compared to the United, to the United Kingdom. And uh, you have to think about where the uh, financial incentives are for doing a biopsy versus doing an MRI in the United States. Um, these are just some of the re old recommendations of uh, the National Health Service. Pros and cons of getting a PSA test is that may reassure uh, you that the, uh, the, reassure the patient if the test is normal. I uh, can uh, find early, I, and once again, I told you there's no such thing as a normal PSA. Find early signs of cancer, um, meaning you can get treated earlier. Uh, PSA testing may reduce your risk of dying if you do have cancer, which is in contradistinction to what the US Preventive Task Force is telling people. I, I should say that the US Preventive Task Force revised their uh, level D recommendation to a level C recommendation, where they're uh, again advising uh, careful shared decision-making discussion about whether or not to get a PSA. My own feeling is get the PSA and then let us deal with it. That's to make a long story short um, and use a risk calculator. The cons of getting a PSA is that it may miss cancer and provide false reassurance, uh, may lead to unnecessary worry and medical tests when there's no cancer, it can lead to the difference between slow growing and fast growing cancer. Cannot tell the difference. Well, we know now that we, we're getting better able to tell the difference between indolent slow growing cancers and fast growing cancers. And then we talked about genetic markers. Um, markers are really useful in men who are under active surveillance because people who are in active surveillance still have a 30% risk of progressing 
And it, it separates out those men who are at no risk versus those men who may risk advancing to more indolent, more aggressive disease uh, who are under active surveillance. Um, it enhances risk assessment and targets men at high risk, those men uh, between 40 and 50 with PSAs of really 1.5. Uh, circulating tumor cells, I'm not gonna say much about this because we're running out of time. Um, PSA is not perfect because of the poor specificity. It has opened the door for early diagnosis and treatment of localized disease and fewer cancer patient deaths with significant downstaging, uh, decreased cost and morbidity associated with advanced metastatic disease. Treatment of indolent disease and complications from metastatic treatment have been markedly decreased by using active surveillance, risk stratification, multiparametric MRI, genetic markers, and other tests like oncocyte DX and confirmed MDFs. So that's it. Time for questions. All right. So let's start with the first one. Um, what is the denominator for the stage shift? If lots of men with clinically silent disease who had not been screened in the past were screened, the percentage of positive will drop without any real benefit. The denominator is the denominator has changed because the number of men who are diagnosed with clinical it's, the denominator is men with prostate cancer, men with known prostate cancer, biopsy proven prostate cancer, and that denominator has changed because we're diagnosing what at the first change um, because we're diagnosing more men with prostate cancer, so. Um, the incidence of advanced and metastatic disease has gone up since the level D recommendation by the US Preventive Task Force. And it's a good point because it may mean that the denominator has changed too. And, but I think that I think that it's significant that, that the, the stage shift that I saw early in my career from 50% to 10% is significant and, and not just based on the change in the denominator, but that's an excellent question. How much subjectivity is part of Gleason scoring? Oh, there's some, but not a lot. Um, I, I would say it depends on your pathology department. Uh, I, I, most of the, um, I think most of the, cancers that are under question, there, there's not much, I, I would say there's not much, I'm not a pathologist, but I would say there's not much subjectivity, which is why that the, um, the deep learning thing that I talked about with uh, using digitalized histopathologic um, analysis of the slides is, is important. But I, I think it's, it's a pretty, I mean, the rules around assigning a Gleason uh, grade is, are pretty, well said. I mean, it's a pretty well established, uh, the pretty well established rules about what's a Gleason 4 and what distinguishes it from a Gleason 3. And then the, the sum score, or the total Gleason score, uh, is the sum of the most common and the most prevalent uh, plus the second most prevalent. And sometimes you have a tertiary score, a tertiary grade. <clears throat> so, say that in one sample, there's um, what the, the pathologist is, is interpreting as Gleason 3, and it's 60% of the specimen, and then the 20% uh, of the specimen is Gleason 4, and there's a small amount of Gleason 5, even. That'll be reported as Gleason 3 plus 4 plus 5. So the Gleason sum score will be Gleason 7. Um, the, uh, and it, uh, Gleason 7 can be either 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3. So then they're not all this, a Gleason score of seven is not the same for all people. It's a Gleason score, a Gleason subscore of four plus three is more dangerous than a Gleason subscore of three plus four. Another good question. All right, just um, if anybody has to hop off, I know we're at the top of the hour, please do so. We'll continue recording so you can always catch the Q and A's on our recording in about two to three weeks. And just a reminder, if you, um, you'll get a, another, when you sign out, you'll get this survey it will appear in another browser. If you called in and you do not get the email tomorrow, please email me and I will send you the survey and slide deck. Next question. <laughs> 
In prostate cancer screening, am I correct in assuming the PSA is collected in conjunction with a DRE? Well, I, first of all, a, a DRE does not increase the PSA. So you can do a DRE and then send the patient off for a PSA. It's not gonna affect the PSA usually. But I think that they, if you're wanting to detect, early detect prostate cancer, you should do a DRE. You never know what you're gonna find. If you find something that you think is abnormal, uh, then you refer to the patient to a urologist regardless of what the PSA is and let the urologist decide whether or not the DRE demands an MRI or a biopsy. Does that answer the question? I think so. Can you provide, the, <laughs> can you provide uh, the, I might add one more thing about okay. DRE. I know that a, a lot of you uh, have been told that you don't need to do a DRE anymore, but it, it requires a, a glove that costs five cents, some lube that costs even less, and 15 seconds of your time. And if you're unsure about what you're feeling, the more you do, the more comfortable you're going to be feeling something. And you never know when you're going to find somebody like my, my friend, the famous athlete, who had a very abnormal DRE, but a normal PSA. And you never know when you might find a rectal carcinoma or some other rectal pathology. So I, I can't tell you how many hours I've spent in conferences and on phones with internists, family practitioners, statisticians regarding rectal exams. I mean, it's a simple part of the physical exam and should be done. That's, that's my two cents. Can you provide the calculation of percentage free PSA again? It's the free PSA divided by the total PSA. If it's, if it's greater than 22%, there's a very low incidence of clinically significant prostate cancer. If it's less than 10%, there's a, it, it's markedly dangerous, okay? Okay. Um, why haven't USTSTF recommend, recommendations not changed? I do counsel my patients on screening PSA and I advise patients of the USPSTF recommendation. I advise patients that statistically on average screening for PSA from ages 50 to age 70 re will result in a reduced risk of death from prostate cancer, but not an increased lifespan. Well, I, I, I tried to demonstrate, first of all, the USP, the Youth Throne Task Force has changed the recommendation, but it's still level C. And they're still um, not recommending doing a PSA in the way that I recommend doing PSAs. Um, that is on 40 year old, 40 or 50 year olds, and anybody who's never had a PSA over the age of 50, you should get a PSA on them. Um, the US Preventive Task Force is wrong, and, and they've been proven to be wrong by many, many other oncologists, urologists, statisticians, not just me. And I, I, I don't think the US Preventive Task Force is, is very, very. Um, they're just wrong. And I would not rely on, on what they say in treating our patients. That's all I got to say about the U.S. Preventive Task Force. <laughs> the next question is about the task force. So you may have answered, but does the task force now recommend digital rectal exams in asymptomatic patients? And if so, how often? No, they don't recommend digital rectal exams. It's an easy one. <laughs> I recommend a digital rectal exam on every male patient that you see in your office. It's part of a part of routine physical. In older men with spinal compression fractures, should we be more concerned about screening PSA or DRE? Any tips on how to estimate the size of the prostate? Um, I think if you got a patient with a spinal compression fracture, uh, first of all, you're going to do it. You're going to make the diagnosis based on a CT scan, probably. Um, you should probably get a PSA on that person. Um, whether or not you do a digital rectal exam, again, I would do it. it takes 15 seconds. Um, but I think 
pathologic fractures are one of the things that happen and you want to know whether or not that pathologic fracture is uh, from, from a, any cancer. Could be from kidney cancer, could be from lung cancer, could be from thyroid cancer, could be from primary bone cancer, you know. A, a lot of times the, pathology, the radiologist will be able to tell you uh, whether or not it could be related to a, to a pathologic fracture, whether or not the compression fractures could, could be related to a pathologic fracture. <clears throat> and it might also see other bone metastasis on the CT scan or the MRI or whatever they're using to diagnose the compression fracture. I think this is our last question, unless another last minute one comes in. But thanks for the fantastic overview, Dr. Lieberman. How do you calculate PSA density before biopsy? I've only ever calculated based on TRUS. Does MP MRI provide prostate volume? Yes. Multiparametric MRI will provide prostate volume. Uh, the best way to, to measure the prostate is by ultrasound. So that means transrectal ultrasound. And that's how you do a PSA density. I myself, a couple of years ago, had a PSA that was 3.4. And I was alarmed because that's, although it's normal by most standards, it was higher than it was the year before uh, significantly. So I had my urologist just do a transrectal ultrasound without the biopsy. And my PSA density, my prostate was 70 grams. And so my PSA density was less than uh, 0 0.08. So I, I didn't, and it was no, otherwise normal. Ultrasound was otherwise normal. And I ha I'd had uh, a multiparametric MRI of my prostate for um, another reason, but it wasn't for my elevated PSA. And so uh, we knew the, the prostate biopsy, uh, the prostate ultrasound, the uh, prostate volume on the basis of both MRI and ultrasound. But uh, most urologists can, First of all, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's in, in the, the bailiwick of a primary care provider to, to do prostate uh, density, PSA density. I only included it to kind of show you that we don't go off and biopsy every person with a PSA, with a uh, an so-called abnormal PSA, even though there's no such thing, or an, an elevated PSA for age or for risk factors, I, I'll say that. So um, the, the urologist, if he's, questioning or wondering at all about whether or not to do a biopsy may in these days uh, go, go with the MRI first. And certainly that's the way it's being done in Britain and Europe. Um, and from that, you get the PSA density. And it's just one more thing to help you make a decision about what to do. I hope that answered the question. I think Another so. really good questions. That's always good when we have the good ones. But um, I think that is the end. I don't see any more questions coming through. So thank you, Dr. Lieberman, very much for, um, for presenting today. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. And as Dr. Lieberman's last slide says, if you have any questions, you can always reach out for an e-consult. But uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah, and the other thing is I, I sent Kristen this thing that I've written. You know, I'm writing a couple of books on urology. And one of the books is, uh, urology for primary care providers. And one of the chapters is, should I get a PSA? And I go into great detail about all this stuff in that chapter. And I'm happy to share that with you. It's a first draft, and so go easy on me. Um, but if, if you wanna read more about PSA and about the controversy around the US Bureau of Task Force, um, there's, uh, I think there's probably 25 or 30 pages of stuff that I've written. So feel free to, uh, access that, Kristen can supply you with that. Absolutely, uh, thank you Dr. Lieberman for that. Okay.